And like I said, we're supposed to live in a civilized free society. We don't. When they can walk in, take you as a child, turn you into a killer, and then use you, abuse you, and when you're when they're done, throw you away. It shouldn't happen. So I sit there and I start taking these puzzle pieces. And I, this fits. This fits. This don't fit. And I'm going like this to picture. And I sit back. The lady walks up to the front. The guy walks up behind me. She looks at him and smiles, says, we've got one, and that's when it started. That, that is where they were weeding out who's good at this, who's good at that, who's going to be a soldier, who's going to be a psychic spy. Everybody knows that Hitler was looking for the ultimate soldier, that super soldier, ultimate warrior. Hitler was also heavily into the esoteric arts with mind control. And they, at that time, they started combining the two mind control, super soldier, ultimate warrior. They just started putting it all together into one project and that's where they got me. My kicks in my right leg were 120 miles an hour. My punching power was well over 18 to 1950 foot pounds. That'll bust concrete blocks. And I put three rounds through the heart of a very high intelligence official. This guy grabs me by the throat and I just snapped sideways, threw my hands, palm down, just threw them down, and screamed inside my mind. The guy goes up and back. I never touched him. I look over and there's George Jr. sitting at the bar with the Secret Service bodyguards, drunk as a skunk, with the Secret Service trying to get him to calm down. Now. That's when I snapped awake. I don't remember driving there. Let's back up and find out exactly how you got into this program. They wanted people who were half Native American and half Celtic, whether uh -huh. it be Scottish, Irish, didn't matter, as long as it's Celtic. The reason for that is that the Native Americans and the Celtics are two of the races on the earth that are more superposed to paranormal abilities or psi abilities. Okay, and as a matter of fact, both of these cultures practice paranormal abilities. So it, it's kind of genetic memory. It, it's in your, our genetic memory, okay? And I, I thought that's basically what it was until about two years ago when I found out that my father was a CIA agent. Uh, my father's been dead now for almost 15 years. I never had a clue. But with that new information, it made a lot of smaller tidbits of information and a lot of things that happened in the past, now it all fits, okay? Basically what happened with me is in 1966, I was six years old, and both my parents loaded me up in a truck, took me to town. Yeah, it's at the edge of dark, it's cold, snowing, I'll, just, I'll never forget the day, okay, because it stands out. Why are we going to a hardware store this late in the afternoon? So we go into the store, and at this time my mom and dad are like, not fighting, but they're not getting along. And I've been in this store several times with my grandfather. And we go into the back, I've never been to the back, and there's a door there that if you didn't know it was there, you'd walk right by it. Mm -hmm. So we go in, and here's six, seven other kids about my age and they're all sitting at these, these tables like these kindergarten tables down sitting down low with the small chairs and they all have the same thing they look like puzzle pieces well this lady comes in that did not fit okay she's tall she's elegant uh the fur coat come on this is eastern kentucky 
okay? <laughs> Don't happen, all right? And she played a very prominent role from there on, because I have, she's in several of my memories. And she sets me down to play. She says, I want, she gives me a stack of blocks, okay? And what they are is each, they're puzzle pieces. It says, make me a picture, and walks off. So I look around for my mom, and she's with a guy there who's in a suit who, again, does not, shouldn't be there, okay? And they have a clipboard, and she's signing some papers. Now, six years old, I puzzled, but you don't think much of it. So I sit there, and I start taking these puzzle pieces, and I, this fits, this fits, this don't fit. And I'm going like this to picture, and I sit back. The lady walks up to the front. The guy walks up behind me. She looks at him and smiles, says, we've got one. And that's when it started. Uh, I was given something to drink. I remember feeling sleepy. And that's it. I've, so are, are you saying, did you go home with your parents no, that night? I, no, I did not. I see. I was taken uh, directly. This is what I found out later. Because once I went to sleep, with whatever was in the drink, the Kool-Aid or soda, whatever they gave me, put me out. My next memory was at nine and a half years old. So you, you have a blank in your memory right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I have some memories have, have came back. And I have bits and pieces of memories of what happened during all that. Some very vivid. Some I have documentation. Some are just memories that are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then from so there. At nine years old, why do you remember nine years old? What happened then? Because I had to take uh, a stint in a hospital. A hospital here, the University of Kentucky. Um, they did some type of procedures that no one's ever really been able to explain to me. Even as an adult, I tried to get the records and no one will release those records to me. And from there, I had a couple of years as a kid where everything seemed okay, a lot of paranormal activity going on and all that. Then at 14, I'm gone again. Gone to Just, the hospital? No, gone. Memories, gone. Oh. Okay, so, so looking back, though, you basically feel that you were trained as a soldier during that time? Yes. Could you describe some of the training to us? The easiest way to do that is to back up for one second. Sure. Imagine Project Talent, the people in Project Talent, being sent to school. Okay. When we're in elementary school, we're all taught the same thing. Okay. That's where the martial arts training was started. I have vivid memories of 15, 20 of us in a group with adults, and they trained us as adults. There was no kid gloves, okay? Six, seven years old, eight years old, you got your butt kicked off. I mean, they beat us tremendously, but we learned, okay? Mm -hmm. Once you, and the paranormal training started as well, Everybody that, that is where they were weeding out who's good at this, who's good at that, who's going to be a soldier, who's going to be a psychic spy. You, you have at this time certain, um, like a black belt in karate mm -hmm. or? I, even after <clears throat> I continued on, I took classes my, uh, on my own, uh, started a couple of studios. Uh, I hold a fifth degree black now, legitimately a fifth degree uh -huh. black. In, in the real world, right. so to speak. Right. Um, now, you also said something in an interview that I read that says something about having um, remembered when you started teaching karate, mm -hmm. this is how you triggered some earlier memories of all right. this. Right. There was one incident in particular. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was an ex-Green Beret, mm -hmm. and he was, wasn't a regular. He would come in and work out with me when he was home on leave or those kind of things. And we're sparring one night, and he's a big rough brawl bone guy, okay, he's, you know, he's going to go on a bar and wipe half of it out and never break sweat. So we're sparring, and I did a technique that when he came up off the floor, he's angry, bum-fuzzled, like, where did you learn that? 
And then it hit me. I don't have a clue. Where did I learn that? And he said, that came straight off the farm. I'm only 19 years old. I said, farm? What, you know, what are you talking about? Cow, cattle farm? Pig farm? What you, I, I didn't have a clue. And he said, the CIA training facility. The farm. And little things started clicking. Hmm. Okay. And when I really started to get memories back was about eight, nine years ago when I had an automobile accident and it ruptured three discs in my neck. And when they finally gave me the MRI, the electromagnetic resonance didn't mesh with the cranial implant. That you had gotten? Somewhere, somehow, I have a cranial implant. And I say this because I have it on film. And when they put me in the MRI machine, when they turned it on, when it started to spin, okay? Right. Imagine tremendous pain. Mm. Also imagine you're in there and you see a thousand TV screens and they come at you at once. On each one of those TV screens is a picture. Each picture is a memory. And it's just coming, 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 coming. That's amazing. That's how I started to get total memory again. And now... I don't know. Was this also correct? You were screaming and I the engine, yes. the, the, the MRI blew up? Or the MRI caught, the machine itself caught on fire. That was, that's what brought, actually brought me out of it. Because I'm there and nothing but my underwear and a gown, holding my head, screaming bloody murder. And I, I noticed smoke, <laughs> okay? And the techs come out, nurses come out, and they grab me and they want to do all this. They get me out of there. They start with the fire extinguishers and, and all that. Wow. Now, now, do, do you have the cranial implant to it's this day? It's still there. It's still there. It's just, from what I understand, it's not working. Oh. And what makes you think it's not working? Because I haven't been used anymore. I haven't been, had the blackout spell and be gone for three or four days or a week oh, with wow. no memory. Okay. They stopped. Right. This one is dead center, dead center in the brain. It looks like a grain of rice. And it's, like, it's just dead center in the brain. It's so it's right that there. small? It's that small. Wow. And I've had it checked uh, through uh, independent sources, and they look at it, and like, you got a problem. It's got to be removed. Man, you're going to die? I said, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I don't tell them what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? I just want their opinion. I want to hear what they have to say. I don't say anything unless I have the proof, or I have someone else who's willing to sign a deposition saying that they were there, they saw what they know. If I don't have proof, I'll say, this is what I think. Okay. So back when you're a child and you go to the, the hospital, you said, mm -hmm. did you have something going on with your body that they changed at that time? Do you know what happened? I remember going through a procedure, okay? And I remember waking up and the, the machine, so this would have been 1969. Okay, and I remember the machine was about the size of this table, canvas wrapped, and they were bringing it down on top of me, and it would get hot. And I wasn't supposed to wake up. I was supposed to be drugged completely while I woke up in the middle of it. And I remember being dozens of tubes over, laying to each side of me where they had been plugged in one at a time. Wow. Now, what happened, I don't know. Now, did you have uncommon strength or were you, you know, did you notice changes, drastic changes in your outlook towards reality? I, I mean, at 14, this is probably hard to tell, but, you know, as time went on, do you think that you developed at a different rate than other children mm -hmm. yeah. because of maybe some of this? I, I think know. so. Um, I've always been stronger, faster, more endurance than anybody around. And that is also the same with all of us that came out of these, these projects. Mm -hmm. That's part of the super soldier structure. Uh, they want the super soldier to be just that super, beyond normal, faster, stronger, more endurance, uh, pain tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. That's what they want. So can you tell us what, um, what abilities you have? But if at the, yeah. the peak of your performance, if you call it, want to call it that, what do you think you were capable of? Physical ones, yeah, I, I, I've kept. 
The paranormal abilities, I have kept some. The main paranormal abilities come out when the alternate personality comes out. That's one of the things that they did to us. They gave us alternate personalities. So we were trained in the alternate personality. Um, I have witnesses that have saw me bust heavy bags with one punch. You're not supposed to be able to do that. I was measured uh, for punching power, speed, and everything at um, Burlington, Wisconsin, at a facility up there. It's no longer there. That uh, did all the testing for the, the pro sports, for uh, the football teams and all that. My punching power, at this time, my weight was 175 pounds. And uh, when are we talking? How many years ago or what year, if you generally speaking? Nine, you... Let's see. 1984. Uh-huh. In the spring of 1984. Okay. And the testing came out as unreal. My punching power was heavier, stronger than that of a super heavyweight boxer. My kicking power and speed was even more than that. My kicks in my right leg were 120 miles an hour. My punching power was well over 18 to 1950 foot pounds. That'll bust concrete blocks. Okay, now in terms of your psychic ability, what were what were those abilities? My primary psychic abilities and the ones that I have kept in this personality is being able to get in someone's mind, uh, being able to far see what's events in real time. Uh, and when I mean getting someone's mind, I don't mean reading their mind, reading their thoughts, hear their thoughts. It's more of what some people that I work with now, we call picting. We see pictures of their thoughts. Like you may be thirsty, thinking about a soda, I'll look at you, I'll see a Pepsi can. Okay, that's what happens. And these type of abilities to a fighter, a soldier, or an assassin, think of the edge that gives that person. So, are you? do you have absolute re recall of times when you're in the other personality now? I have witnesses to that, yeah. See, what happened is, <clears throat> I w I'm not supposed to remember anything right now, okay? <laughs> I imagine. The people who start to remember are usually late 50s, early 60s, okay? Much too old to really do anything, but I'm not saying 60s old, but in this society, by the time you're 60, 62, anywhere in there, people so write you old, off. So how old are you now? Because I, I, I can't tell. I'm 46. Uh -huh. I know. No, no, so, everybody says you don't look 46. That's one of the ever traits that we have. Mm -hmm. None Longe of us look our age. longevity. Yeah. Okay. Um, most of the people who start, when they start getting their memories back, when they get their memories back is when the personalities begin to, to mesh. They're no longer personality A, personality B anymore. They start going together. So when all the, these other memories start coming in, meshing with the other memories, they go nuts. Most people. So most people, most of these people committed suicide. Okay. Okay. And not the ones who didn't wind up in asylums. Is it possible, Duncan, that they could also have been programmed to commit suicide? Yes. Like yes. a kind of self-destruct when no longer useful? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So you kind of have beat the system in a certain sense. Mm hmm And you must have had struggles so what's keeping you going, and what is it that you think allowed you to, to sort of maintain? After the car accident, we moved from this area. We moved to upstate New Jersey. I was never supposed to lift anything over five pounds again. I was never supposed to hold my, be able to hold my arms above my head. That's how serious the neck injury was. Two o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting <clears throat> in my apartment in New Jersey. And this little voice comes in and says, what the f is your problem? What's wrong with you? You wimp, you're going to give up? You've been a fighter all your life. Get up and fight. I started doing push-ups at night. A year later, I'm fine. So you, you basically brought yourself back from your injuries. The injury's still there. I can go to a neurologist right now, let them do an x-ray, and they'll look at me and say, you need to be in surgery today. Okay. Huh. But I refused to go. 
um, the pain is still there. I live with pain 24-7. And again, if I hadn't, this hadn't been done to me as a kid, yeah, I'd probably be taking pain pills on a regular basis. But you're not. I take nothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, now I'm curious because you have this tattoo on your arm. It looks actually kind of beautiful. Um, Is this something you got in Vietnam? No. Uh, this was it was supposed to be one of a kind. <clears throat> it's my design. Really? This was something that came to me in a, in a dream, actually. Wow. And I designed it. Is and that is that a dragon? That's, that's a dragon. Uh-huh. And I had uh, a tattoo artist do it for me. And it stayed one of a kind for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing <laughs> seeing it out. And she does have her work on a website. Uh-huh. And then I'm walking in the Walmart across the street of all places about six months ago. And there's a paperback novel. With and that's on the front cover of the paperback novel, identical. And you designed it. And I designed this. Wow, cool. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, so what happened in Vietnam? Because you have a really an amazing story about that. I was in North Vietnam twice that I know of. Okay. okay. Some of these areas are still murky. Because, mm -hmm. I, like I said, I keep finding out more things every day. Okay. Once when, when we were, I was 12 years old, okay, I know people say, my God, 1972, you were in Vietnam in 1972. Actually, we weren't in Vietnam, we were in Cambodia. Okay. We weren't supposed to be in Cambodia. <clears throat> a Navy SEAL team and a Marine Corps recon team were pinned down by the Cambodian May Rouge. They called in for reinforcements, somebody to get them out. And I'm telling you exactly what a Marine Corps recon captain and a Navy SEAL captain told me. Now, I have my own memories of it, but I saw it from my point of view. I'm going to tell you what, from their point of view. A black helicopter, a Huey, lands. Twelve kids come off the chopper. Yeah, there still are a couple of things. It's Take your time. We got all the time in the world, now, and I can understand. Um, long story short, we came out, came off the chopper, formed a semicircle, and we all held hands. There was. Were they all boys? No. Were they all around the same age? Yeah, I was the oldest. Okay, so all around the age of 12? Anywhere between 9 and 12. I was team leader okay. on that. Um, we held hands, raised our arms, and killed them all. Who did you kill? Every May Road soldier within 20 miles. How did how is it that your powers were able to target the other side and not? I wasn't the um, I wasn't the, I'm trying to think of the phrase. I was like the lead battery, but I wasn't the one who who did the target. Aimed, so you didn't you didn't actually aim your power. You guys were the power. Someone else did the aim. Was it the kids that did the aiming, or someone else completely? Some, one of the other kids. Oh yeah. Okay. Now, did you know the other kids? Mm hmm At the time, you knew the kids? I know one right now. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, is this person willing to come forward or not? Not this one, no. Are they even aware that they're one of them? Mm hmm Are they? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, we really appreciate that you're sharing this with us because this is obviously a, a huge thing, and people never like to talk about the sort of negative side of... Yeah of the power of the powers of the mind but obviously this is is one of the applications and there's no reason to hide it um, it's not that um, it's funny uh, I've done a lot of things that were not of my doing not of my making mm -hmm. uh, some of them bring out an emotional response some don't some are kind of like so what and some I have no control
Mm -hmm. And I go through this little emotional, and then I'm okay, and then I'm fine with it. Sure. You know, it's like I can't cry on command. Believe me, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, the way it was explained to me, it makes perfect sense. Twelve kids, imagine twelve batteries. Connect. You have one battery. You might get a. Oh, okay, nothing. Add two, you get you get a jolt. Add three, you get a burn. Add twelve, mm -hmm. you get electrocuted. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we did. The twelve of us jo linked, joined up, through everything. Kind of to see my circle start from the center because I was in the center, like this, out. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And this is something you guys were obviously trained to do. Right. Do you have a re have a memory at all? Has anything come back of your trainers? Remember the lady in the hardware store? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she figured very prominently when I was young. Uh, the next memory I have of her is in a lab coat. Oh. And I'm in this house. It's been described to me as the mansion. And I have my couple of ideas where this place is or was, but I have no, I have no proof. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a, I'm in a hallway, and there's green and white tile, these huge, these 12 by 12 mm -hmm. tiles is on, on the floor, and I'm doing something that all of us can, that come out of this has the same trait. We don't like come down on one knee or anything like that, we squat. Makes no sense in some ways, but in some ways to us it does. We, we squat on the balls of our feet with the arms out loose, almost like an animal, okay? Okay. About 10 feet away I have a small water bucket. And what I'm doing is raising the bucket, trying to turn it over, sit it down gently. Raising it with your mind or with Correct. your hands? Correct, just with my mind. I see. And what I'm doing is I'm raising it, turning it about halfway, and it's just dropping. I'm not getting it, okay? And I look around, and she, this lady's behind me with her clipboard, you know, taking notes. And I tried to get a response. You know, I looked at her trying to be nice. I said, I've almost got it, I've almost got it. And she basically just looks down, snarls, and walks off. Oh. You know, there was nothing nice about any of this. Hmm. Wow. So, okay. Do you, you said you were in Vietnam twice to, mm -hmm. that you remembered. What was the uh, second time? The second time, all I remember is being shot down. We uh, were taking off in a uh, Black Hawk. No, I'm sorry, not a Black Hawk. That was, uh, <laughs> that's when another incident uh, in a Huey. And we got about 10 feet off the ground and took some anti-aircraft fire and we, we went down. And this Navy SEAL captain, who we've talked about, is the one that pulled me out of the chopper. Oh. So this, and this is the guy, the witness that mm -hmm. you say is also w witness to the Vietnam incident that you told us right. with the kids. Correct. Um, and he was in charge of the where was he at the time? The easiest way to say about this guy, uh, his whole family was CIA. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, he was one of the most decorated and had one of the best kill records in Vietnam. His uh, abilities as a sniper were unparalleled, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, he was also a sailboat captain because he pulled, I think, fi uh, five or seven tours in Vietnam. So, but he wasn't messed with the way you were, I'm assuming. He has, does have some memory gaps, mm. yes, okay. but not to the extent that I have or some of the other. And how did you guys hook up? When I started getting my memories back, I started looking for him. Because you knew who he was? I mean, you mm -hmm. now you remembered from the age of 12 who he was? Yeah. I remembered his face, and I knew being what he was, he's going to only be in certain circles. So I started frequenting those circles. And I finally found him and we sat down at dinner at a casino and started trading stories and 
that's history. Wow, that's great. Is he willing to come forward on record? This he time? is, yes. Would you introduce us? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, you were, I'm going to imagine you were a remote viewer, am I right? Not one of the best, but yeah. Okay. Um, so you were physically trained, you were mentally very astute. What was your title? Were you, in other words, you said some were psychic spies, some were warriors? Correct. Um, my problem, and I've been told this by some very strong sides, is my problem is that I fight the psychic abilities. I don't just let them flow. I fight them for whatever reason. I, I block them myself. Mm -hmm. I went, as I graduated through Project Talent, you know, I said it was a school, moving on. I, what, what age was this, would you say? This would have been uh, mid to late teens. Okay. I was turn, turned into a soldier, a soldier with psi abilities. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I wasn't one of those that was put into the pitch black room and could tell you what a politician 4,000 miles away was having for breakfast. Okay, I wasn't one of those. Okay. I know some people who were. Sure. But I wasn't. Now, do you, did you know um, Joseph McMonagall in that? That name does group? ring a bell. Uh -huh. I've been asked that before. I just can't say for sure. Okay. Um, so where were you based, do you think? I mean, uh, you weren't based in Kentucky. No. No. Um, I have memories of being in several different training facilities. Uh, I do know I spent three years on St. Thomas, on the island of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Mm. And that was verified to me about three years ago. Okay. I'm going around seeing people and they're look, looking at me and saying, I haven't seen you since you were a kid. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, when you, once you were trained, you were sort of ready to go. So where did they use you? Do you have any idea? You know, were I you didn't. in war? Um, After Nam, um, I, has, I do have some vivid memories of a couple of assassinations that were carried out. Uh, I have memories of being on military bases. And I had it verified that I was at Norfolk Station, Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia, uh, by a radar man who was stationed there when I was with a, a team. And he contacted me because he saw my picture. Mm -hmm. And so he told me, he was, t he, what happened during this time is that he told me things as fact that happened that I thought were just dreams slash memories. And he's telling me this without me telling him anything. Did you, were you an assassin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was. And I don't know, how did you assassinate people and, and what kind of people would you be assassinating? Do you have any idea? I mean, were they people in wartime? Were they no. Americans? Some, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, one that I remember, and I think I remember it so vividly, is because it was the last one. The last time I ever did anything for the government was in uh, D.C. And I put three rounds through the heart of a very high intelligence official. Now, do you have conscious memory of this? Or? Of this one, I do, yes. Okay. I never knew the name. I was given a, a photo, a target habits do the job that's it and do you do you remember any operations taking place in other countries France in France mm -hmm. that's interesting what the vivid memory is that I have and I also was shown a photograph of me sitting at a little cafe mm -hmm. from the Eiffel Tower okay mm -hmm. I have no knowledge at that time of being in France but the guy shows me the picture. It's a eight by ten black and white, and there I am, drinking something out of a cup of steam, and there's the apple tear in the background. Wow. And I remember doing a job, but I don't remember what it was about. Uh, a decoy was sent in, and what the lady was to do was to get the guy to come out of the bar, hopefully not exactly in his right mind, inebriated if possible. And my job was to snatch, grab, get the information, and then terminate. And I remember doing the snatch and the grab, and then the memory 
fades from there. Uh -huh. So you must see movies, right? No, I don't. Oh, you don't. You don't go to I movies. I can't. Okay, because I, I was wondering if, if maybe you know, there's a lot of violence in movies, a lot of scenes of that kind of thing, and I was wondering if those might trigger some of your memories. They do. Violence per se does nothing. I love wrestling. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I used to incorporate professional wrestling techniques into my my teaching when I was an instructor. It's not the violence per se. The last movie I tried to watch of that nature was The Born Identity. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get halfway through it. Uh, I just, I do a total change. Okay, you see your personality does a change? If my personality changes. Uh, God help whoever I'm watching a movie with. And I usually, I'll just get up and walk away. Sci-fi movies don't bother me. But anything concerning government black operations, CIA, NSA, uh, covert killings, mm -hmm. I can't do it. Do you have any remembrance of other planets? I know this sounds a little out there, but I have no, heard of No, actually, <laughs> actually not. Uh -huh. There is one thing that a couple of us share, and that is a deep fear and dread of the planet Mars. Bring up the planet Mars to us, and it's just like watching well, I was one of those just movies. About to, I was just about to do that, so yeah, Mars specifically. There is something about Mars mm -hmm. that changes our entire attitude at that time. Uh, I know one person who point blank says they better leave Mars alone. Leave it alone. Meaning leave it alone, don't talk about it, or meaning don't, don't go, go there? Don't go. That they're waking something up. On Mars? Mm-hmm. Now you're, okay, you're still a psychic, would True. you say? Okay. So you must have some thoughts or associations with Mars. Are you willing to talk about that? I mean, because I don't, I, I know that you said that you, you develop headaches sometimes after these talks, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you know, reveal and kind of go back in your own mind as to your history. I'm having well. a good one right now. Headaches are part of the conditioning. Sure. Okay. It's a, it's a headache, but it's a fake headache. It's a, it's a programmed headache. I'd like to know if you see um, special machinery. Yes. Okay. It's underground. Uh huh. And have you seen any certain kind of beings there? Yes, they're in stasis. It's like a kind of artificially induced hibernation. Thank you. And is that, um, it's not humans that are in that state? No. It's the beings. And they're, they're very tall. They have long features. Um, Do they look like the Egyptian? Uh, quite the a leaders? bit. Okay. Quite a bit. We talk a lot about anger in in the recent interview that I saw that you've got, I guess, on your site. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us a little about that? Can you describe the anger, how you deal with it? There was, at one time, it was pure rage. When these memories came back and when I started, I sat down and I started putting together all the things that, starting at six years old, all the things that was done to me, things that I was forced to do, et cetera. It was pure rage. You know, my first impulse was to go to D.C. and just go nuts, okay? Well, as the old saying goes, I'm crazy but not stupid, okay? And as a fighter, I was trained, channel your anger. Don't let your anger channel you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I started doing. So I took, instead of just being so mad I can't do anything, I turned that anger to being so mad I want to do something. And I've been, I've stayed that way. So is that why you started writing books? No, actually I started writing as just kind of my own therapy, just to get it out. Mm -hmm. And I had never written anything. And somebody read some of it and said, this is pretty good, you need to keep it up. And so I did. And now you've got a book coming out, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Yeah, uh, Deadly Awakening. Uh, it's about everything we've talked about here, plus all the 
side streets that we don't have time to go up. Um, it's supposedly going to be turned into a movie. Okay, that totally caught me off guard. So, well, that's that's wonderful. I'm, um, you know, that that's very exciting. In terms of telling your story to a wider audience, what would yeah. you like to result from that? I would like to see enough people wake up to march on Washington and say these projects stop mm -hmm. and hold the people accountable. Okay, there's not there's not going to be class action lawsuits. There's not going to be prosecution. That's fine. You know, I got over that years ago. Everybody else involved needs to get over that. Just hold them accountable and stop it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is still continuing this day? Yeah, absolutely I do. Do you have any information about in what form these projects are continuing? I Remember think you said in the 60s there were a thousand kids of which were one, there were only yeah. 60 left. In 1966 there was supposed to have been 1,000 that were taken worldwide that was in my group, as it were. There's only about 20 of us left now. You know, I think what I have to have to explain we were actually, at six, seven years old, put in survival to fist, okay? Our personalities were split. Anyone, any normal kid, any normal person would not do the things that we did mm -hmm. in their right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. So they had to split our personalities, and they had a clean slate with that new personality. Had no rhyme, no reason, no right, no wrong, no concept. So they made it into what they wanted it to be. This is how they split my personality. Now, I don't know. I'm sure they did the same identical thing to other people, but, but I know for a fact not to each one. There were different techniques for different people, different kids. Now, the way it was described to me when I was a kid is it's your treatments, almost medical terminology. Imagine being six years old, and this is one of the funny things. I can talk about this about with very little emotional because it was done to me, not something I did to someone else. You strap naked to a wooden chair. Arms out like this. Here, you're strapped here, here, and here. Your fingertips are spread open. Things are inserted here. So you can't do this. And I know you noticed, because I saw it in your mind and I saw your eyes, I'm constantly I have a phobia about my fingertips. What they did is they inserted needles underneath the fingertips. That's bad enough. Hook those needles up to electric current and turn it on. And waterboarding is where you, you basically drown the person and then bring them back. And in my case, uh, they did two ways, strapped to a chair and would take a water hose and just spray it, you can't breathe, and then you, and you're you gone, and they bring you back and all that. And then I remember having my head dunked. That's why I don't swim. Now what would be the purpose of that? To, to cause pain, intense pain. What happens when the body and the psyche goes through, the amount of pain it can tolerate, you black out. You pass out, you faint. Well, the Germans brought over a drug with them. Once injected, it blocks those receptors. You can't black out. You can't even force yourself to faint. So once the psyche has gotten to a point to where it cannot take any more, you have two choices. Split off into another personality oh. to save yourself mm -hmm. or die. Okay. Okay, I understand. When the pain becomes too much, the way you're able to survive and stay together mentally is actually to go someplace else. Exactly. And you go so far someplace else that you're actually in another, you're creating another you, you part create, of you. Exactly. You create a total separate individual mm -hmm. to where they can pull out that alternate personality. Now, one second I'm me, next second I'm somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now I'm back to me. That's how they wanted you. Have you seen Manchurian Candidate? No. You never saw that? No. Okay. Um, well, if I refer to that movie, you'd 
I don't know if you know what I mean, but... I know what the Manchurian Candidate is, You yeah. know what it's about. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible that you could be activated by a phone call, say? The last time that I did a job, that's what it was. I got a phone call in the middle of the night. Can I be activated now? I do not think so. They burnt the chip out. Okay, do you think it's a tone? Do you think it's words? I mean, do you have any idea what, what it is? is? I think it's music? a combination. And I think it's more than one. There's, um, in order to open a combination safe, you've got to have a combination, which is more than one number. So I think what they did, they set up, you have to have a system of checks, balances, and fail safes mm -hmm. to where if you're watching TV and all of a sudden you hear the correct word or whatever, you, you freak out and kill everybody, then you would start seeing this happening everywhere. There has to be a fail safe to keep that from happening. So I've always thought that it's a combination of words, tones, numbers, I see. What, ha what have you. But what happened during this night is we, I was in bed. My wife and I were in bed. The phone rings, I reach over, pick it up, put it to my ear. No more than three seconds pass. I hang the phone up, I get up, I get dressed, I leave. I'm gone three days and three nights. And at that time, we lived exactly 11 miles from the airport that you guys passed coming here. Oh. When I came back three days later, there was only 22 additional miles on the car. Mm -hmm. I went to the airport. But you have no memory on where you went. I went to D.C. This is when I went to D.C. and did a termination job on this oh. individual. Now, what year was that? 1985. So this is quite a while ago. Yeah. And here's something that I didn't, I'll tell you guys, I didn't want to put on the tape. I'm sitting in a Mexican restaurant, very nice two-story Mexican restaurant, and I hear somebody laughing. This was before the president now was the governor of Texas. I look over and there's George Jr. sitting at the bar with the Secret Service bodyguards, drunk as a skunk, with the Secret Service trying to get him to calm down. Now, that's when I snapped awake. I don't remember driving there. And I'm looking around and I'm, where the hell am I at? And, but yet, there he is. I have one impulse. Kind of terminate. And I had a gun in my pocket. And for whatever reason, I fought the impulse down, and I didn't kill him. In other words, you remember who he is now, but you didn't know who, who he was At when that you were time, there? I didn't have a clue He was who just was. some guy who was getting drunk with Secret right. Service around him. Exactly. I did not have a clue who he was. Now I'm sitting there watching the news sometime later when the governor of Texas has announced his bid to run for the presidency and I look at him and I'm like, holy. Oh, well, this was before he became president? Yes. I got it. Years before. So in that context, maybe it makes even more sense. Mm -hmm. And it's even scarier. What about underground bases? Do you think you've ever been in an underground base? I know where one is, <laughs> right here in the state. Um, when I was in my mid-late, mostly late teens, okay, that I remember, the farmhouse that we lived on was situated in a valley. And there were old logging roads that went all the way around the valley. I had a good five mile run up and down the mountains on a good graded road. There was also some worked out strip mines over to the southeast of there. Well, one day I'm running out through there and I decide to drop down the hill and go over and look around. As soon as I do, I, start, I can feel the vibrations in the ground. And I drop down and I put my ear to the ground the way my grandfather you know, taught me how to do. And I get up and this little boy says, get the hell out of here. As I'm running back up the hill, a chopper lands. Wow. I didn't go back anymore. But a couple of days later, two things happened at once. Okay, My father had a friend. His name was Paul Preston. 
Paul Preston was somebody, and still is somebody, that I would terminate with extreme prejudice. I don't care to say that. When I was 14, we were getting ready to work the field. We had a cash farm. And I was working on a tractor. We lived about a mile up a dirt road, off the main road. And I can sense a vehicle coming before it's halfway up. I stop and I look out, okay, and I see this grayish silver van coming up into the driveway. It's brand new. Has a UHF antenna on top. I've never seen anything like this. Again, this is Kentucky in the mid 70s. Nobody had that kind of money. This was before the coal boom, before the energy crisis, before people made 20 bucks an hour. You know, people were lucky to make minimum wage, okay? And this guy gets out of this van, and I notice it has Texas tags. I had heard my dad talk about this guy. They were childhood friends. And then this was confirmed to me later on that they were in the CIA together, that Paul Preston was actually station chief in more than one area. But he gets out of the, the van, just calls me by name. I never met the guy before, to my knowledge. And in that instant, I had two thoughts. One was run, because this guy's bad news, this guy's dangerous, run. The other was take him out, kill him before he kills you. Okay, I'm only 14 years old. Wow. Yeah, my hair was longer then than it is now. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad comes down from the house. And they do the handshake, slap on the back, huggy, huggy, all this kind of stuff. Well, Mr. Preston looks at my dad, gets real serious, says, we got to go talk. You know, my dad changes, his demeanor changes. So they go away for about 20 minutes. And all this time, you know, I got the tool chest, I'm working the tractor going, you know, spring plow, you know, all that kind of stuff. 20, 30 minutes later, Paul Preston comes back down from the house. He ain't talking to me then. He's in a real bad mood. Gets in the van, leaves. I barely saw my dad the rest, rest of that day, because it's early morning, because it's still cool. You know, you don't want, didn't want to be around him the rest of the day. Okay, he was one ticked off Irishman. Well, that night, okay, my mom had a habit of sitting on the front porch at night. And I slept upstairs. She came in that night about 10, 11 o'clock, screaming for my dad that there's something over top of the house. And by the time he went out, it was gone. And I could hear the whole, the whole conversation. She said it was bigger than the house, was round, had lights all the way around it. I didn't know anything about UFOs. I knew nothing about that. I knew farming. I knew martial arts. You know, I knew how to fight. I knew how to hunt, how to track, et cetera, et cetera. I knew nothing about anything like that. So the next night, this happens again. The third day, Something happens to me, okay? All the time I work and I train. I work and I train. So I'm going 12 hours a day every day. I worked out even harder than I had ever done before. And I think the reason being is to go to bed early because that's exactly what I did. I went to bed early. That night, I go to bed. I'm laying there don't know how long, but I feel like I'm on fire when I snapped awake. I can't move. All I can do is open my eyes. The whole upstairs is full of light, and I can see a bipedal figure standing by the bed. I can see a head. I can see the arms. I can see the legs. That's it, and I know it's talking to me. It's telling me something, and the next thing I know, my dad is shaking my shoulder because my brothers saw the light and they thought the upstairs was on fire. That's all I remember. I don't remember anything again until I'm almost 18. Meaning no memories between the age of 14 and the age of 18. Right. I didn't get my driver's license until I was almost 18. Hmm. I should have had them at 16. I didn't get them until I was almost 18 because I wasn't around to get them. Do you remember what the being looked like other than two arms, two legs? 
That's all I could see. A torso, two arms, two legs, and a head. Not an oval shaped head, but a head, head shaped head. Normal, a normal uh -huh. shaped head. Um, I estimate maybe six feet tall. Uh -huh. And it was white as well, but a paler shade of white than the rest of the white in the room. Mm. I think all of these go together. The visit from Paul Preston, the craft over the house, and then my leaving again. All go together. And your father's anger, perhaps? Yeah. I think he may have thought, for whatever reason, that I was clear of it. And then Paul Preston comes back and says, uh, no. Hmm. I don't think he had a choice in the matter. Um, the only anger I have with them is not coming out and telling me something. Mm -hmm. Okay, Especially after I'm, adult, I'm an adult and I start getting memories back and I start saying, okay, what gives here? I know this isn't what happened. I know this wasn't right. What gives? I think I, you know, I think I deserve more of an answer than can't tell you and leave. The first thing I did is when I started getting memories back is I started looking up old friends. And I would ask them, during this year, 73, 74, 75, where were we? What were we doing? I have memories of doing things. And every one of them, to a T, we were doing this. We were out have doing this. Well, I remember that. They go, how could you? You weren't here. Hmm. And one guy even went so far as to say, we went up to the farm to pick you up one day to see if you wanted to go away. We hadn't heard from you. Your dad ran us off. Those were, so what I had of those years were false, false memories. Huh. <clears throat> the memories I had of camping, going to the Dairy Queen, you know, that kind of thing, were implanted. So, <coughs> you, you also said in your writing that you have a, one of your arms is, is wired or something, is the what right you call one. it? Uh -huh. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the implant is right here. I know it's right there for two specific reasons. One, I had a guy put the, a meter over it and they found it that way, and two, it itches. Mm. And what it is, I call it an enhancer. It increases physical strength and, and speed. Is <clears throat> there's like wires that run from it to go down the arm, add into the fingers, and it's only in this shoulder and this arm. It's not body-wide. Mm -hmm. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, this is the hand and the arm that I busted many heavy bags with. Um, as a matter of fact, there was an incident to where I grabbed a guy who was a good 40 pounds heavier than me and just straight up off his feet. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized what I had done, mm -hmm. it just dropped. And it's like, it's tied, I, I don't know the science of how it's tied in. I, I really don't. But I know that it's tied in with the fight or flight scenario. When there's danger, it kicks in. If I feel threatened, it kicks in. The throwing of energy, yeah. That one freaked me out when it happened. Um, I had a job in Lexington, a place that was, at that time was called the Community Kitchen. Now, there was no kitchen. What it was was a, a facility for homeless, indigenous, that kind of thing. We had uh, doctor's offices, we had social service offices, showers, clothing, all that. But it was also a haven for pushers, users, abusers, rapists, killers, you name it, they came in there. We could, ha we could have 60 to 100 people in the facility at any one time. And I was chief of security. And we had a fight that broke out. I mean, it was nothing. We'd have three or four fights a day, okay? But we had two girls get into it. They fight worse than men, okay? And my partner had one holding her down. I was holding the other one down. And when I say holding them down, I was just sitting there with one arm on her shoulder, okay? She was laughing about it. And the next thing I know, I look up, and I see this extremely large man 
standing over top of him, and he's got three or four friends with him. And he's giving this routine. I'm giving you the account of whatever to get off of her. I'm going to do this. Well, I snapped. I'm on the ground. I look up. I see I'm outnumbered, outgunned. I changed. Normally, I would have just rolled out of the way, got up, started cussing him right back at him, threw him out the door. Uh, no. I stood up and hit him. And the witnesses there said, I didn't just hit him once. I hit him 12 times in a matter of a second. It broke his neck. His neck was as big as my legs. And it, it just snapped his neck. Well, when that happened, the whole facility went berserk. It just went, half of them were coming at me and my partner, and the other half was using it as an excuse to get whoever they didn't like. Mm -hmm. And it's during these times that something happens that I can't explain. It's like I step outside the space and time. Everything turns black and white. Everything goes slow motion. Mm -hmm. It's like... I've got all the time in the world to go from point A to point B because this guy ain't moving. Okay, and it's like I'm just walking through, bam, 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 guy's going down, and then I'm grabbed. This guy grabs me by the throat, and I just snap sideways, threw my hands, palm down, just threw them down, and screamed inside my mind. The guy goes up and back. I never touched him. And when that happened, that ended the entire fight. Because I'm standing there, and I'm looking around, and I'm suddenly aware that everybody's staring at me. And somewhere during this time, the cops have been called. <clears throat> so here come the cops, here come the ambulances, the paramedics. <clears throat> and I talked to one of the cops, give the report. Uh, half of them are taken to the hospital, the other half are barred out, some are taken to jail. And I went to the nearest bar I could find. Mm -hmm. And I sat there because I didn't know what to do. I knew what it, I knew something had happened. I knew it was real because people were saying, were coming up to me, what did you do? How did you do that? And I'm like, I don't have an answer for you. I don't know. What year was this that this happened? 19, either 89 or 90. I'm trying to, I worked so many jobs during that time, during those years, which is something else that I've been told is vindicative of all of us that came out of these black operations. <coughs> None of us could hold a job. It was like, and I know from personal experience, <coughs> we'd be the greatest thing since sliced bread for a couple of months, and then all of a sudden, the boss or supervisor comes out, finds something wrong, and we're fired. What I found out over the, over the years is that I'm, that's not unique to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> is they want to keep you one step below poverty level, keeps your mind occupied on other things. Right, survival, right. daily survival, so that you, you can't go further into your own memories type of thing. And there's also another reason for that, and I've been told this by more than one person, who listens to somebody who's broke? Mm -hmm. Sure. But everybody listens to someone who's wealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that's, I think those two go together to make, to make that. There was an incident which you also reported that you described uh, as a kind of personal teleportation oh, yeah. incident where you went through a wall and you had a witness. Yes. Absolutely. What do you recall about that? I get freaked out every time I think about that one. Um, it was at a house in Oklahoma. And I was helping a friend of mine move. And I was in the one bedroom, and she was in the kitchen. For me to get from the bed to the front door would have entailed going down, cutting across, down, cutting across very winding way. Well, as I said, she was in the kitchen. Straight line. Kitchen, living room, front door. No door in between. No wall in between. 
Well, she was reading and doing her own thing in the kitchen, and I'm sound asleep. And her youngest son gets up screaming and goes to the front door trying to get out. This is 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. She jumps up, starts to run to get him. I hear the scream, and I, I remember raising up on one, one shoulder in the mine, seeing the kid reaching toward the door, and I'm at the door. She said that I came through the wall in front of her, and all she could do was to stop and say, whoa. And I think whatever I did, if I had froze inside that wall, that would have been fun. <laughs> Uh, my grandfather, my mom's mom, was a full-blood Cherokee, and he gave me the name of Gray Feather. Gray Feather? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I asked him once, I said, you know, Pops, what does Gray Feather mean? And he said, you're a tween man. And he had an accent, and, and, and I said, a what? <laughs> he said, you walk between worlds. And this is before I knew anything about anything. I saw 9-11 two weeks before it happened. I put it up on some bulletin boards on the net, was laughed at. I lived in Delaware at that time, right on the eastern shore, walking distance to the beach. I had a trip planned to Boston. A couple of days before the trip, because we were going to drive it, I get a phone call. And it's the metallic digitized voice says postpone your trip. Two day window plus or minus one day, wherever here, here, or here. It's gonna be something big happening in New York. You don't wanna be don't be caught in it. Now have you had other premonitions that haven't come true yet? Yeah. I have I've seen this country almost split in half. Uh, I mean physically split in half. Again, I, I lived in Delaware, and I just laid down, and it's one of those times where one minute I'm here, next minute I'm here, okay? And I'm looking down on the United States. This is before I knew about the super volcano and, and all this and that, but I saw that area all going up into Canada, coming all the way down into Mexico. The whole western part of the country split off from the rest of the, of the United States. And what I'm seeing is like a, a river of fire coming all the way down. Wow, and did you have a timeline for that? Soon, mm -hmm. very soon. So do you, are you making any plans for yourself and your family because of what you're dreaming or seeing? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Going, are you finding a safe place? There's really not gonna be a safe place. Um, the best preparedness that I know of is to, to be able to be mobile. Mm. There is no one safe place. Okay. I started to go public when I lived in Delaware uh, after an attempt was made on my life. So when was that approximately? About um, 2002. I was out for a jog. I mean, I'd had other things happened before, but I didn't, at that time, never made the connection, okay? Now I make the connection. I was out for a jog, and it, it's in the wintertime, and I hear a motorcycle. Motorcycle? You ever been on the East Coast in the wintertime when the wind blows? It's frigid. I have, actually. Yeah. And I'm out jogging, and I hear a motorcycle, and I start, the ears go up, the hairs start standing up, one of those. So I go from a a hard run just to a light jog, and I see the motorcycle, solid black. No insignia, just solid black. Two riders dressed in black. Black OPEC face mask. I'm going this way, they're coming this way. This thing is going so slow, I'm trying to understand how in the world it's staying up. And it, as it comes up to me, I'm running scenarios. Okay, I'm wearing, I'm wearing ankle weights and wrist weights. Like, okay, I'm waiting to see a gun. So I'm thinking, this was coming off, this is going to throw, forward row, 
kick the back wheel, try to get an advantage. Just all this is playing out of my mind. The guy does open his coat, puts his hand in his coat. This is the, the, the writer. All I see are two fingers. Points them at me and goes like this and goes back. And I'm thinking, okay, this is just a warning, okay? And they slowly go on down the road, going towards Route 1 to go north. I didn't make it 10 steps. I had puke, bile, everything. I had to crawl home. I was sick for three days. I finally got to the doctor and said I had some kind of unknown viral infection. He did shoot me, just not with a gun. I think half the people who hear what I have to say look at look at it and say, what a lying stack of dung. This is so much BS. There is no way any of this could happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'll give a response that I gave a guy on a radio show one night. I wish that were true. I'd love to be able to take a pill every day and have a nice life, but I can't because it did happen. And I don't have the whole story myself. And I may never get it. What happened to me, you know, and I, 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 know, I, I told about how they split the personality. That's just the tip of the iceberg, okay? I remember the beatings, uh, to being thrown naked into a refrigerator, a refrigerator room, because I couldn't get something right. You know, this went on and on, and not just to me, but to all of us that, that were in this particular group. And this stuff shouldn't happen. You know, we consider ourselves a civilized, free society. There's nothing civilized about this. There's nothing free about this. There is strength in numbers. I would like to see, I mean, come on. You can have a million-man march on Washington put together by somebody that the government laughed at. Why couldn't we do the same thing? This stuff has got to stop. You know, people, and like I said, we're supposed to live in a civilized free society. We don't. When they can walk in, take you as a child, turn you into a killer, and then use you, abuse you, and when, you're, when they're done, throw you away. It shouldn't happen. And you asked earlier, what is the one thing that I would like to see come of this and any subsequent movies, videos, whatever. I want to sit in a chair just like this in Washington, D.C., in front of the full Senate and demand answers. I'd do it in the heart. I ain't shy.